The Great Gilly Hopkins, Chapter 10, The Visitor. The week before Thanksgiving, Mr. Randolph came down with the flu. It wasn't a bad case as flus go, but he was an old man and any kind of sickness, as Trotter said, was harder on the old. So with many rest stops for Trotter to recapture her wind, she and Gilly brought the roll-away cot down from the attic, and they set it up in the dining room, turning the never-used room into a sick room for Mr. Randolph. There had been a great discussion as to whether big lawyer son should be notified, and Mr. Randolph was sure that if his son knew he was sick, he would be snatched away to Virginia, never to return again. Trotter recognized this appalling possibility, but maintained that there was some moral obligation to inform next of kin when one took to one's bed. Suppose he just shows up one day and finds you sick. Then he won't trust you no more. He's sure to take you away then. But Mr. Randolph thought it was worth the risk, and they had compromised by having Mr. Randolph move in so Trotter could keep a close eye on him. Now, what's going to happen if you die on me? Oh, I promise not to die in your house. You have my solemn oath. Gilly, if he looks peaky... <laughs> We can carry him next door as fast as we can go. I ain't going to be sued no by, by no big Virginia lawyer. Mr. Randolph raised up off the roll away. If I die on you, you can sue me, Miss Trotter. You can take me for every cent I have. <laughs> he lay back down giggling and gasping. Huh, every cent? You won't even have no social security if you're dead. You better not die. That's all I got to say. I promise not to die, but with these... These two beautiful ladies nursing me. Oh, I may decide to remain ill for a long time. Well, the chat, that's a chance I got to take, beautiful as I am. But if you ain't well enough a week from today, you're going to miss out on the turkey and the stuffing. So Mr. Randolph swore a solemn oath to be well by Thanksgiving. And as it turned out, he was a little bit better. But by then, both Trotter and William Ernest were both down with the bug. Trotter fought going to bed, but her fever was high and she was too dizzy to stand up. And despite her protests, Gilly stayed home from school Tuesday and Wednesday to nurse the three of them. And Thanksgiving Day found her exhausted from going up and down the stairs and from bedside to bedside. And it occurred to her that if she could get sick too, nobody would blame her for collapsing. But of course, she didn't catch anything except some irritability from not sleeping properly and worrying too much. She called Mr. Randolph's doctor, Trotter's doctor, and the pediatrician for William Ernest, but nobody gave her any help. The patients were to stay in bed and take aspirin for their fevers. Gilly chopped an aspirin in half with a butcher knife for William Ernest, and one piece flew out of sight under the stove, and the other piece, which she got down the boy's throat, with no little difficulty, came right back up again promptly, along with the bowl of soup oof, that she had coaxed down earlier. She was afraid to try any more aspirin. Trotter told her to wipe his face and arms and legs with a cold cloth, which seemed to help a little bit with the fever. But the child was still miserable, and clean as she might, the smell of old vomit just hung in the room. The whole house was a mess. In fact, even the rooms like the living room and the kitchen, which nobody but she went into, began to look as though they had been bombed. She was simply too whipped, too wiped out to pick up after herself. By Thursday, she could care less about Thanksgiving. The turkey that Trotter had bought was relentlessly defrosting on the refrigerator shelf, but there was nothing else to remind her as she sat at the kitchen table dressed in jeans and a shrunken t-shirt that was too small, chewing her late breakfast of a bologna sandwich, while the rest of the nation would soon be feasting and celebrating Thanksgiving. Dum -dum. The doorbell rang. She jumped at the sound. Her first fear was that lawyer's son had not believed Mr. Randolph's excuses for not coming to Virginia for Thanksgiving, and that he had come to get him. And then, with annoyance, she realized it was probably Agnes Stokes sneaking around to find out why Gilly 
had skipped school for a few days. But when she opened the door, it was to a small, plump woman whose gray hair was peeking out from under a close-fitting black felt hat. She wore black gloves and a black tweed overcoat, which was a little too long to be fashionable, and she carried a slightly worn black alligator bag over one arm. The woman, who was an inch or so shorter than she was, looked up, looked up into Gilly's face with a sort of peculiar expression. Whether frightened or hungry, Gilly couldn't have said. At any rate, it made her shift uncomfortably and push at her bangs until she remembered two of Trotter's trusty sentences for emergency use, and she offered both of them. We're not buying anything today. Thank you, and we're faithful members of the Baptist Church, and she hurried to close the door. No, uh, wait, please, the lady said. Are, are, are you Galadriel Hopkins? Gilly yanked the door back open. Who are you? She blurted out as awkwardly as William Ernest might have. Um, it was the woman's turn to look uncomfortable. Um, I suppose I'm your grandmother. Somehow Gilly would have been less surprised if the woman had said fairy godmother. Uh, m may I come in? Dumbly, Gilly stepped back and let her in. The sound of snoring poured forth from the dining room. Gilly willed the woman not to look, not to stare at the funny little brown face poking up above the faded quilt. The mouth gaped open and trembling with each noisy breath. And but of course, the woman looked. She jerked her head slightly at the sight, and then she turned quickly back to Gilly. Gilly, honey, who is it? Oh, damn, Trotter must have heard the bell. It's okay, Trotter, I got it. Gilly yelled as she tugged at her shrunken t-shirt, the last half clean one, and she tried to make it cover her navel. Do you want to sit down? She asked the visitor. Uh, yes, please. Gilly led the way into the living room, and she backed up to the couch, sticking a hand out towards the brown chair. Plunk. They both sat down in unison, like string puppets, the lady right on the edge of the chair so that her short feet could touch the floor. So, um, the woman was bobbing her little black hat. Did anyone in the world wear hats these days? So, um, Gilly was trying to take it in. This? This little old lady in the old-fashioned hat and coat? This was Courtney's mother? In all of Gilly's fantasies, Courtney had never had a mother. She had always been, just existing from before time, like a goddess in perpetual perfection. I, I am right, aren't I? You are Galadriel. Her voice was southern, but smooth, like silk, to Trotter's burlap. Gilly nodded. My daughter, the woman fumbled in her purse and brought out a little, my daughter left home many, um... She snapped the purse shut and raised her eyes to meet Gilly's puzzled ones. Many years ago, I, well, my husband and I, well, I, I'm sorry. Helplessly, Gilly watched the little woman stumbling for words, trying to tell a painful story, but not knowing how. My husband, she tried to smile, but y your grandfather... He died nearly 12 years ago. Perhaps she should say something, thought Gilly. Ah, uh, yeah, geez, that's too bad. Yes, yes, it was. The woman was pushing hard against the words to keep from crying. Gilly knew the trick. Oh, boy, how she knew that one. We, well, we tried to contact Courtney, your mother, at the time, of course, but I was not able to. In fact... The pitch of her voice went up. She stopped trying to talk and she took a handkerchief from her purse, barely touching each nostril before putting it away. Go ahead and blow, honey. It'll make you feel better. Charter would have said that. But Gilly couldn't quite get the words out. As a matter of fact, the woman had recovered herself enough to continue. As a matter of fact, this letter, this letter is the first direct contact we've had with Courtney, my daughter, 
in nearly 13 years. Are you kidding? said Gilly. She felt sorry even though the woman's pain didn't seem to have anything to do with her. I didn't even know she had a baby. Wouldn't you think she'd want her own mother to know that she'd had a baby? Side note, this grandmother never knew about Gilly till just recently. This was obviously the point where she, Gilly, was supposed to come into the story, but it still seemed far too remote, like something that had happened once to a friend of a friend. She tried to nod in a sympathetic manner. Gilly! Gilly, I called you and called you! William Ernest was standing, clutching the doorway for support. His face was still flushed with fever. He was dressed in his long, grayish-white underwear, and at the sight of a stranger, he stopped dead. The woman looked at him once hard, and then, as she had done with Mr. Randolph, she looked quickly away. I'm sorry, W.E., Gilly said. I didn't hear you calling me. What's the matter? As soon as she asked, though, she knew. His long johns were wet all down the front, and Gilly jumped up. Excuse me, I'll be right back. She hustled the boy back to his room as fast as you could hustle a boy who was still weak from fever and lack of food. It was hard to be patient with him on the stairs. You shouldn't have come downstairs, William Ernest. You're sick. I wet, he said sadly. I couldn't help it. She sighed, I know, when you're sick, you just can't help it, W.E. She got him the last clean underwear, which was short and wouldn't be as warm, and she changed his sheets. She took a dry blanket off her own bed. He climbed in and turned his back to her at once. His strength was exhausted. Gilly, honey, Trotta called drowsily as Gilly passed her door. You got company down there? No, no, it's just the TV. Gilly smoothed her hair and tugged again at her shirt. It was too small as she went down the stairs. She knew she looked a wreck. She must have shocked the poor old lady right out of her socks. The woman gave a weak smile and nodded when Gilly came in. You poor little thing, she said. Gilly looked behind her to see if W.E. had followed her down the stairs. Bless your heart. There was no one else around. Me? Courtney did not exaggerate. I'm just glad you wrote her, my dear. How could they have put you in such a place like this? Me? What was this woman talking about? What place? I know I shouldn't have burst in on you like this, but I felt I had to see for myself before I talked with your caseworker. Will you forgive me, Galadriel, my dear? Would you... There was a heavy thumping on the stairs, and both of them sat stark still and listened as it drew inexorably nearer. Oh, the little lady gasped. Swaying in the doorway was a huge barefoot apparition. Apparition is another word for like a ghost. In striped men's pajamas. Gray hair cascading over its shoulders with a wild look in its eyes. I forgot! It was a moaning as it swayed. I forgot! It grabbed frantically at the woodwork. I forgot! Gilly sprang to her feet. What did you forget, damn it? The turkey! Trotter was almost sobbing now. Fifteen dollars and thirty-eight cents and I let it go to rock. She gave no sign that she noticed the visitor. Not, nothing's gone to rot. I would have smelled it, wouldn't I? Gilly couldn't help sneaking a sideways glance at the little woman, who looked almost as frightened as W.E. did when he spied a new word in his reading book. Go back to bed, Charter. I'll, I'll put it right in the oven. The huge woman made an effort to obey, but nearly fell down just trying to turn around. Oh, I better sit a minute. I'm feeling lightheaded. Gilly grabbed the back of the striped pajamas with both hands and she half dragged, half supported the faltering frame towards the couch. But she knew, just as one knows when piling on one final block on that tower, that it's going to fall. She knew she wasn't going to make it. 
Oh, mercy! Trotter gave a little cry as she came crashing down, pinning Gilly to the rug beneath her. Bam! The woman lay there, flapping on her back like a giant overtorn turd of tortoise. Well, I've done it now! She gave a short, hysterical giggle. <laughs> I think I squished you juicy! Well, 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 what is it? The third night-clothed actor made his entrance. You all right, Gilly, honey? Asked Trotter, and without waiting for an answer, It's all right, Mr. Randolph. But, but someone fell, fell. I heard someone fall. Oh, I fell all right. Trotter was rocking hard, working her huge trunk in vain effort to get off of Gilly and to her feet. It's okay, ain't it, Gilly, honey? Just roll, Trotter, said a muffled voice. Roll over and get off me. What, 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 what's that? Mr. Randolph squeaked. It's poor little Gilly. Trotter grunted and with a supreme, Ugh! she rolled off a Gilly onto the floor. M -m Miss Gilly? He was asking anxiously. I'm okay, Mr. Randolph. Gilly got up, dusted herself off, and then took him by the hand. Let's get you back into bed, Mr. Randolph. And by the time she returned from the dining room, Trotter had somehow hoisted herself into a sitting position on the couch and dizzily clutching the cushions with both hands, she found herself face to face with this white-haired stranger. You said wasn't nobody here, she accused Gilly. The visitor, for her part, was teetering on the absolute brink of the brown chair in what Gilly took to be a state of total shock. But the small lady proved capable of speech. I... I think I better go, she said, standing up. I don't, I, I, I don't seem to have come at a very good time here. Gilly followed her to the door, eager to get her out of this loony bin. The house had suddenly become. I, I'm, I'm glad to have met you, she said as politely as she could. She had no wish for the woman to think poorly of her. After all, she was, or at least she claimed to be, Courtney's mother. The woman paused, and resisting Gilly's efforts to hurry her out the door, she reached over abruptly and pecked Gilly on the cheek. I'll get you out of here soon, she whispered fiercely. I promise you, I will get you out of here. Ugh, fatigue and exhaustion had made Gilly stupid. She simply nodded and closed the door quickly behind the little form. It wasn't until she had gotten Charter back in bed and was putting the turkey in the oven, that the woman's meaning became clear. Oh. My. God. Well, it didn't matter what the woman thought. Miss Ellis could explain about today. Nobody could make her leave here. Everybody needed her here. Besides, Trotter wouldn't let them take her. Never! That's what she had said. Never, never, never! the end.